The year is 2002. My parents take me to Toys R Us and I'm hoping to leave with Super Mario Advance 3, Yoshi's Island. But when we go to the counter, they tell us it's not in stock. So they give us a choice of two games, Super Mario Advance 2, which I already have, or Wario Land 4. Now, despite knowing exactly what bootleg games were, but not knowing who Wario was, I assumed Wario Land 4 was a bootleg, like a Sonic 6 or a Samari. I'm looking at the cover and saying to myself, this isn't Mario. My parents are waiting there like, son, please just pick something or you're going home with nothing. I'm given this totally crap choice of thing I already own or a bootleg. But at the risk of having nothing to do that weekend, I brought home Wario Land 4. And that was an excellent choice. This was my introduction to Wario and the Wario Land series, and I love this game. It's tricky, it's fast, it looks and sounds fantastic for an early GBA title. The extra endings and difficulties make the game so replayable and rewarding. I used to take this game everywhere as a kid. I love Wario. Playing this game back then must have like rewired my fucking brain because it made me hate Mario. Don't get me wrong, I think the games are fun, but Wario Land 4 made me realise that I wasn't playing Mario for Mario. Mario, the character, is a completely inoffensive, family-friendly presence in gaming. Which is fine, but it also makes him utterly devoid of any personality or lasting interest for me. Wario is a greedy, selfish asshole, and we love him for it. The guy is a breath of fresh, albeit putrid air, which comes across in how different the gameplay is compared to Mario's outings. Wario is practically invincible. Enemies and obstacles just bounce right off of him. The guy is relentless, unstoppable, in his pursuit of what he wants. Cold hard cash, baby! Since my introduction to the series with Wario Land 4, I did go back to catch up and play the other games in the series, except this one. The subject of today's video, Wario Land Shake It. At the time I'm writing this, I can't think of any particular reason why I skipped out on this game when it released. I remember keeping up with the game when it was on track to release in 2008. I remember that crazy Shake Up YouTube ad. I remember loving the hand-drawn art style when they showed the game off. And I wasn't exactly tired of Wii Motion gimmicks at the time. The game received pretty solid reviews across the board, so I'm not exactly sure why this wasn't like a must-have title for me at the time. What has certainly brought a spotlight back onto this series again is the release of Pizza Tower earlier this year, a game that shares some of its influence from Wario Land 4. As much as I would love to jump straight into Pizza Tower, to at least try to stay up to date with game releases, I feel I owe it to my stoutly friend to play his last game in the Wario Land series. Wario time! Shake It begins with Captain Syrup infiltrating a museum in search of treasure. She discovers an ancient globe, which turns out to be the Shake Dimension. As she gazes into the globe, she witnesses the chaos unfolding in the dimension, with the Shake King taking control and imprisoning Queen Meralda and her mirthful subjects. Syrup steals the globe and sends it to Wario as a gift, promising him that the true treasure lies within. Wario attempts to break open the globe, but is interrupted by a mirthful who pleads for his help. Initially, Wario is disinterested, until it is revealed that the Shake King has stolen the bottomless coin sack, a never-ending source of gold coins. Wario, now invested in the situation, decides to follow the Murphle into the Shake Dimension. That's it. Aside from the tutorial level on Syrup's ship and the goal of beating the five area bosses to find the Shake King's lair, that is pretty much it for the story and its setup. It's a short and charming intro that helps you get straight into the gameplay, which would be a nice segue into talking about the gameplay, but I feel we've got to talk about what's going on with how this game looks. The most immediately noticeable aspect of the game is its hand-drawn 2D art style. Shake It was developed by Goodfeel. If that name rings a bell, you're probably familiar with their later works, Kirby's Epic Yarn and Yoshi's Woolly World, games that at least aesthetically aim for a unique approach to their respective series. 
During the game's development, over 2,000 frames were drawn to animate Wario alone, encompassing more than 200 actions. Additionally, there were over 6,000 frames for all the enemy characters, some of which went unused. This demonstrates the tremendous amount of work that went into the game's animation. Initially, the development team had concerns about this approach, as any changes made during development would require modifications to each individual frame of animation. They did consider using 3D models, but after testing the game with line drawings, they quickly realised the impact this art style had on the overall experience. Personally, I'm delighted that they ultimately decided to stick with the hand-drawn approach. While it's not uncommon nowadays, or even at the time, to see games aiming for this hand-drawn style, I believe the animation work here is fantastic and highly expressive. This approach not only helps games like this stand out, but also ensures that they age much better than their contemporaries. In 2008, gaming was going for what can be referred to as its brown era, so I think the broad colours used in this game would be received very well at the time. With support from Production IG, who also animated the game's opening and ending sequence, and Kusanagi Inc, who specialised in drawing backgrounds, they were able to pull it off. Just a side note, I did try looking into specific artists and animators from these companies who worked on this game, to see if they had any traits or influences, things that they might share across several projects, but these guys' portfolios are massive. They have done a lot of different stuff, and I couldn't narrow down anything too specific. Just throwing this out there, if anyone knows anything or is better at cross-referencing video game credit pages with anime sites, I'd love to hear about it. Wario Land Shake It follows the trend of other contemporary titles on the Wii by adopting a control scheme that involves holding the Wii Remote sideways resembling an NES controller. The D-pad is used for movement while the 2 button allows for jumping and the 1 button triggers a dash attack. With a quick shake of the Wiimote, Wario unleashes his new move, the Earth Shake Punch. Capable of stunning enemies on screen or activating specific level gimmicks like movable pillars or bomb blocks. Similar to Wario Land 4, Wario can pick up enemies and objects, but this time aiming is done by tilting the Wii Remote after grabbing an item. There are numerous contextual actions that can be performed with a shake of the Wii Remote, depending on the player's location or interaction with the environment. For example, you can pick up coin bags and give them a good shake to spill out all the coins within, poles that Wario can spin and jump from with a quick shake of the Wii Remote to build momentum, or various vehicle gimmicks, like this Unibucket. The controls for these actions feel very intuitive, which is a characteristic I've always appreciated about how Nintendo implements motion controls in their games. While there is a fair amount of shaking or waggling of the Wiimote in Wario Land Shake It, I wouldn't say it's excessive. I think it's pretty well balanced in its utilisation of motion controls, enhancing the gameplay experience without becoming too tedious. Borrowing the level design structure of Wario Land 4, players venture through levels in search of treasure, while progressing towards rescuing the captured Murphles at the end. Once the Murphle is freed, alarms are triggered, initiating an escape sequence where you must rush back to the beginning of the level. This sequence sometimes follows a slightly modified path reminiscent of the hurry up segments in Wario Land 4. What's really been changed is how Shake It handles progression and difficulty. In previous games, exploration of the levels was essential to progression, but in this game there's not much deterring you from going straight towards the Murphle and exiting the stage. That is all you really need if all you want to do is finish the game. Other goals such as missions and collecting treasures are entirely secondary. Technically the only other thing you need is money. Players can purchase maps from Syrup Shop to access new areas. These maps are available to buy right from the beginning, allowing players to unlock and explore different levels in any order they want, as long as they have enough coins. While Wario does have health points, there aren't many enemies or obstacles that can significantly damage him. Unlike previous games, you don't lose coins when taking damage. As long as you collect enough coins along the way, the adventure can be quite a breeze. However, for those seeking a more challenging experience, it becomes evident that the game encourages players to tackle its missions and collect treasures. Treasures are amusing collectible items hidden throughout the levels, some of which can be quite tricky to find. It's incredibly rewarding to figure out how to reach these chests when they seem just out of reach. Additionally, the flavour text in the menu adds to the charm of discovering 
them. Missions vary from level to level, ranging from 3 to as many as 7 per level. Most missions are straightforward, such as completing the level without taking any damage, finishing within a specific time limit, or collecting a certain amount of gold coins. These are the most common missions, and I often feel compelled to attempt completing them all in one run as a bit of a self-imposed challenge. However, there are also missions like Don't Break the Unibucket or Don't Touch Any Fossils, which may not be clear until you've beaten the level at least once and understand how these elements interact with the rest of the level. Furthermore, there are missions that seem contradictory, like Don't Defeat Any Enemies, paired with Defeat the Golden Enemy. These missions make it clear that the game doesn't expect you to finish a level with all missions completed in one run. Reading the mission primer prior to starting a level will definitely shift the focus on how you approach each level. The first time through the game will have you experimenting with all the different mechanics and gimmicks, and at worst will feel frustrating knowing you'll have to go through the level again just for one particular mission. That aspect of the game is probably the least fun you'll have going through it. Another aspect that I'm not particularly fond of is the Max Fastosity Dasherators, or Maxes, featured in most levels. The first few times I used them, I definitely felt they were exhilarating and fun, but in terms of long-running level gimmicks, I feel that it restricts the player by dictating where the fast portion of the level is. It can be frustrating when you're on a section that requires the speed power-up to break through barriers, and one wrong move, or run all the way back to the Dasherator to get the speed boost again. In comparison, I believe the dash move in Wario Land 4 was far superior as it gave players more control over the pace of the levels themselves. I believe it would have been far more fun for players to look at the level design and figure it out for themselves to figure out how it can be used effectively to build up their speed. This kind of design is littered in other parts of the game, so I don't understand why they just lumped a giant red machine in the level that might as well say, go fast here. Transformations, Wario's take on power-ups, I feel were underutilized in this entry, which is a shame because I feel are a big part of the series' identity. Mario, or most video game characters in general, collect an item that gives them a power that they control for a finite amount of time or until they take damage and lose it. They usually serve as a moment of empowerment for the player. In contrast, transformations, I would argue, have more in common with status ailments from RPGs. It's a status that's inflicted on the player that is usually meant to hinder rather than help, but true to Wario's character, the player can usually take advantage of it. For example, Zombie Wario is, well, he's a zombie. He becomes slow and unable to jump as high, but can crumble and pass through thin platforms, which is useful unless you land on a platform you don't intend to pass through. In Wario Land Shake It, transformations like Fire and Snowball make a return, and that's it. There isn't the same level of crazy diversity going this time around, and the setup for what the developers want you to do with these transformations is pretty much spelled out in the level design. Trigger this transformation, run there, jump here, open this block, etc. I can't really mark Shake It Down for this. After all, I earlier on applauded the game for its readability and intuitiveness. I think I'm more just baffled by the omission of different transformations, something which I viewed as being pretty important to Wario Land's identity. The bosses in the game are a notable highlight, featuring a diverse range of quirky and strange characters for Wario to face off against. While they don't have much narrative significance, they serve as satisfying conclusions to each area and test your abilities based on what you've learned, as any good boss fight should. I particularly appreciate bosses that offer multiple ways to exploit their weak spots, as it allows players some control over the pace of the fight and rewards skillful play. We haven't really talked about the Shake King much. Beyond the intro, he's mostly absent from the game, only making an appearance if you happen to run out of time during an escape sequence. But the game makes up for his lack of presence with the presentation of his boss fight. In most forms of media, it is typical to establish the protagonist and antagonist as opposing forces with contrasting ideals and perspectives. However, in this game, we have two characters driven by their insatiable greed both desiring the magical bag. Not only do they share this common goal, but they also exhibit eerily similar movesets and motives. Wario is basically fighting himself. It's pretty hilarious. In any other scenario, these two would be best buds. This unique portrayal adds an interesting dynamic to the story. By foregoing the traditional hero-villain dynamic altogether, we instead get a throwdown to see who can be the greediest piece of shit. 
it's comedy gold, and in the end, Wario shows he truly won that title by chucking Meralda out the way to get to his gold. He's like, out the way you daft bitch, I want my money. At the end, there's even a fun twist that conveys to the player the moral lesson that being a greedy piece of shit isn't going to get you anywhere unless you're smart about it, as he's outwitted by Syrup. Overall, I think the game is pretty solid. Considering the developers at Goodfeel hadn't worked on Wario Land before, they took a lot of the right inspirations and lessons from prior Wario Land entries and made something accessible for newcomers, but took their own approach on how to implement challenge for those wanting it. After the credits, a text prompt appears informing you that Murphles will now provide hints about levels containing secret maps. These maps unlock more challenging levels. What I appreciate is that you can actually discover and unlock these levels during the first playthrough if you know where to look or stumble upon them by accident. While I did try out several of these levels, I decided to leave them for my own enjoyment in order to release this video in a timely manner. Looking back at everything I've written, it seems like I've been overly critical of the game by constantly comparing it to Wario Land 4. I realise that this might be unfair on my part. However, the silver lining here is this. Wario Land 4, to me, was the pinnacle of the series and I wouldn't bring it up so much if I didn't believe that this game and its concept were in the right ballpark when it comes to recapturing some of that magic. Considering that Goodfield took on the series with no support from the previous developers, working solely off the experience they had going and experiencing those previous games for themselves, they picked a direction to go in and executed on it and I think they did an excellent job. Clearly, Nintendo also recognised their talent by entrusting them with more of their IP and working pretty closely with them following this game. It's been 15 years since Wario Land Shake It, and while Wario himself is still around in various other games, I feel his appearance in this series, that he stole from Mario by the way, is unmatched. I think the Wario Land series is well past due another entry. But until then, I'm gonna go play Pizza Tower. Okay, bye. Yeah.